What a truly fitting song for this day. And more fitting than you may know, but you will know by the end of this message. In fact, how fitting and what a blessing for me to be before you all today. Because if some of y'all remember last week during welcoming announcements, I mentioned that it was my dad's birthday when he was here. And I also mentioned to you all that were here that I might not be here this week because he was probably going to get me and get me by, y'all weren't going to see me, but God's mercy has afforded me the opportunity to be before y'all one last one more time. So I'm thankful that my dad was not too mad at me for announcing his birthday. And then for us to be here on July 4th on a Sunday, on a Sunday now, that is not a somewhat easy task either in preparation or, or imagining being here because I know in your hearts and minds, especially after last year and coming in this year, now we, we, we outside, as people say. Some of y'all are already thinking about the hot dogs, the hamburgers, all right, the potato salad. <laughs> Think about this evening with the fireworks, but, I'm, but I, I pray that you can just permit a few minutes of your time to hear a word. If you would, Please turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John. So John, the 8th chapter, and we're going to read a few verses from the 8th chapter of John's Gospel, verses 31 through 36. And for those that may not have it in front of you, you can also follow along on your screen, on the screens. In John, the eighth chapter, verses 31 through 36, read, Then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And he answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How saith thou? Ye shall be made free. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Mm, mm, mm. Here in the United States, today is a day of celebration. A day which many, now don't miss the fact I said many, not all, celebrate freedom, independence from British colonial rule and the forming of the United States. A day in which there's pride for many, again, Don't miss that I say many, not all. Understand, they get their understanding of what freedom means to them from this moment in America. A place historically recognized as the land of the free. Well, the question that comes to my mind when thinking about July 4th is what is freedom? Is freedom about the breaking free from the rule of another nation? Is freedom about the choice to do, or to say, or believe what you choose to believe? And if freedom is more of the latter than the former, is it really freedom if one's freedom comes at the cost of freedom of someone else? Mm. There is a difference. However, my brothers and sisters, between freedom and liberty. Now, listen to this definition closely. I didn't include it in the slide, but probably should have. Liberty entails the responsible use of freedom under the rule of law 
without depriving anyone else of their freedom. Freedom is broader in that it represents a total lack of restraint or unrestrained ability to fulfill one's desires. So liberty goes deeper in its understanding about the responsible use of freedom. Hold on to that definition as we go forward in this message. Freedom and liberty are more than a worldly defined state of being. I hope you understand. I hope you don't think that freedom and liberty are just defined by what, what you see on, on someone's big over obnoxious flag riding around on a pickup truck somewhere around the city or in, or in the state or you know on some, on some banner or some moniker. It is more than that. We learn that both freedom and liberty also have place in the spiritual realm. The intersection between spiritual freedom and worldly freedom became a part of the world with God's blessing upon Adam in Genesis 1, 28 and 30. You can go ahead and read that one for yourself. As he gave blessing unto Adam, he said, this is what you're able to do, Adam. And you have dominion over these things, all these things in this world. Freedom and liberty, however, were under attack when sin was introduced into the world when Adam and Eve disobeyed the Lord's commandment in the Garden of Eden and Satan's influence spawned the spiritual battle between good and evil. Here in John 8, 31 through 36, we find another way of looking at freedom and liberty. We learn where spiritually defined freedom dif differs from worldly defined freedom. We also learn that despite the attack on spiritual freedom through sin, we can still find freedom and a better understanding of liberty through our faith in the one who came to redeem us from the bondage of sin, Jesus Christ. I'm here to share with you today, my brothers and sisters, that true liberty came into this world through the hope in Christ and was fulfilled in Jesus. For a subject, I want to talk about liberty, the hope in Christ. Liberty, the hope in Christ. And I know you're seeing, hey, looks like an acronym for Christ. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. The first thing I want to bring out of this today is the problem of sin within worldly defined freedom. The problem of sin within worldly defined freedom. Now, you start, as you see this image on the screen, hopefully you're starting to think about all the things that are coming out of us, but that means these things were in us at some point. All these things that we're concerned about, all the things that we're, we, we focus on because we're free to get these things. We're free to go on trips. We're free to play on our cell phones. We're free to watch whatever sporting event we want to watch. We're free to drink whatever we want to drink. We're free to go and do and think and feel whatever we want to feel. We're free to go to the gym and work, our, you know, and work ourselves out until, until we're weary. All these things that we focus on because of worldly defined freedom. But let me tell you, there's a problem there, and that problem is sin. My brothers and sisters, we live in a country that touts our freedoms, but we live bound to many sins. What are some of the ways that we struggle with sin here in the United States? There are some things that the Bible predicted would come in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. Now, I'm going to leave it up on the screen, but let me talk to you about what some of these things really mean for us. Some of the things we see here in the United States, this mentality of survival of the fittest, this by any means mentality, capitalism, got to go get yours. Systematic oppression, institutional, and all the things that it includes, institutional racism, police brutality, the criminal justice system, human trafficking, and even the drug trade. It's this focus on materialism and how much I can get 
And that's what makes me seem free. That makes me seem like I'm getting mine in this world by how, much more, how many things I own, how much I, I have in, in my possession. And ultimately what it ties back to is the love of money. How much we focus on it because of the love, not because the money is, because remember the root of all evil is what? The love of money. And how that ties all into this indulgence of vices and allegiance to self above community. And it's right there in the verses of scripture, this allegiance to self above community. Many believers at churches across America will quote the A portion of Psalm 3312 today. Bless is the nation whose God is the Lord. And they will quote this as a means to justify the ideals of a superficial success of a nation which calls itself one nation under God, but has long since been fractured due to a problem of sin within its definition of freedom. Mm. I don't, don't, let that, don't, don't let that go over your head. We're, we're in a country that says we're one nation under God, but... We see all the things that this one nation under God has, has ha allowed under its, under its wings. And certainly we say, how can a nation that is under God allow racism and hatred and hurt to its own people? This problem with sin has misguided both non-believers and believers alike. Look at the allegiances that believers many of which are the evangelical Christians, have formed with a worldly leader in our former president. Willing to essentially follow a man who actively mocks others rather than shows compassion, oppresses the poor, the widow, the orphan. We know he certainly oppressed the orphan by all the children he shut away from those who, who um, were trying to become citizens but had not yet become citizens and that sowed seeds of division amongst his own, his fellow countrymen. One of his well-known claims is of the false news being shared about him whenever someone in opposition attempted to share truths. Believers standing for someone who actively spreads lies is one of the reasons that we as believers have fallen into a tr the trap that the Apostle Paul warned us about in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. That also would be something you can see there on the screen. Mm. We learn, however, that in verses 31 and 32 of the 8th chapter of John's Gospel, of a truth bearer that has come from heaven. Right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In fact, let's, let's look back at how we know he is the truth bearer. Verse 31 said, And then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Mm. Throughout John 8, Jesus professes that he was sent unto the people by God the Father. And specifically in verses 31 through 32, that he is the bearer of truth to those who believe in him. Yes. Why is that important? Because in this time, meaning his time, sin was rampant in the world, even amongst God's chosen people, the Jews. Religious leaders were more focused on preserving their power and prestige then on teaching the truths about the coming Messiah and encouraging the people to keep hope in his, com in his coming. I don't want y'all to overlook that. Religious leaders, not worldly leaders, not just the, not just the, the, the religious, not just the, the community leaders of the time, not just the Romans that, that were oppressing the people, but the religious leaders. The ones that are supposed to know better, the ones that are supposed to be able to recognize him. Religious leaders were more focused on preserving their power and prestige than on teaching the truth about the coming Messiah. 
and encouraging people to keep hope in his coming. Now, some might say, yeah, they were trying to encourage it, but they were encouraging it under the vice that they were going to be the ones that were going to tell the people when the Messiah came. This was clearly evident because the religious leaders themselves could not recognize the Messiah who, came, who just came as Isaiah prophesied. Not only did the religious leaders have a sin problem, the people that they served did also. How do we know this? Although verses 30 and 31 spoke of a group of Jews that believed in Jesus, Jesus had to exhort them to continue in his word because he knew that there were many that were present who rejected it and would urge the others to reject it also. It's right there in the text. If you read it, you know, you can see, if you go back in, in chapter 8, who, who was there? Our, friend, our favorite Pharisees and Sadducees were right there. As this was the chapter, we also learned about the woman caught in adultery. And we learned that Jesus first went up to the Mount of Olives, and then he came down into the temple, and he was teaching. And as he was then teaching, all gathered, including our friends, the Pharisees and Sadducees, and they showed out. Jesus had to, you know, rebuke them, but then also had to you know, set the standard about judgment of others. And then as he introduced who he was in his father and his father in him, that's when they started riling up a little bit. But there were still some that said that they believed. And there probably were, were some. But I found it interesting that it specifically said in, amongst the Jews here in this point. Now, why is this important for us? After all, being obedient as a disciple, because discipleship is what we're talking about here in, these, in 31 and 32 in particular. After all, being obedient as a disciple conflicts with the definition of worldly freedom, which we defined earlier as more akin to the lack of restraint or the unrestrained ability to fulfill one's desires. Being a disciple, meaning you are under leadership of somebody else, the world tells you, oh, how can you let somebody rule over you? How can you let someone tell you how to worship? How can you let somebody tell you how to live your life? That's the, world, that's the world's way of looking at this. And the world's way is, is due to the problem of sin. The problem of sin is that it twists the truth of freedom. Being a disciple does, in fact, give us liberty. Remember, we talked about liberty earlier as it teaches us a responsible use of freedom, to love our neighbor, to forgive one another, to not judge one another, to help each other, and to seek justice by not depriving anyone else of their freedom. And that's one of the things I love about this thing called freedom, the spiritual freedom that we are, are clarifying, as we even heard in our Sunday school lesson today, there's a difference in, in the understanding that we have to have in, in the spiritual sense. And in fact, we see it in verse 33, and it says, They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How saith thou, ye shall be made free? Could you just, could you just picture them? Talking to Jesus this way. Of course, now we know Jesus and we, we, we adore and worship him, but how do you just talk to him? He just kind of, you know, just a condescending way. You know how some people talk to you all condescending when they don't agree with you? How can you say, we are Abraham, see? And bondage is no man. What are you saying about how we, how we ain't free? Well, hmm, this is interesting. The reaction of, to hearing of a truth that would set you free shows that the people were dealing with the problem of sin within their definition of freedom. Their definition was worldly, right? Because what were they focused on? We, we Abraham see, ain't never been in bondage to no man. <laughs> well, it's because they attempted to mix their spiritual allegiance into it. Because they were descendants of Abraham, they felt like they were never in bondage. Although clearly they are letting their pride get in the way. As we know in reading the Bible, of the numerous times the Bible shares in the Old Testament that the Israelites and their descendants went into captivity under other nations. 
Now, don't miss, because they'll try to tell you, oh, but we're talking about spiritual. What did they do when they were in bondage? They intermingled with the people and with their beliefs. That's why, as we heard about earlier in, in Sunday school about the Samaritans, why there was so much hatred, because they intermingled. And But yet, oh, no, no, we're Abraham's seed. We have never been in bondage. We have never intermingled. Our faith has never been, it has never been changed or deterred. Right, right, right. That's, that's just like people today that will tell you, I ain't never did that. I ain't never been in that situation. I don't know what you're talking about. Even the judgmental church folk will tell you that. How can you live like that? How can you do that? How can you be like that? And then somebody uncovers the book of their life, or suddenly, or maybe walks into their home, their, spirit, their home, and suddenly opens the door, and out of the closet falls all the bones of all their, of all the I ain't nevers. I ain't never did that. There it is. I ain't never been there. There you were. I ain't never. We know that Jesus is going to one day open a book. God's going to open a book. And out of the book are all the things that we have done wrong going to fall out. So certainly, speaking to God, even though they didn't understand who they were talking to, they just re they, they, they are going to realize, and I'm sure they had realized once their, their life ended, that they were going to have to talk to the same one. And he's like, oh, you remember. You were Abraham's seed. Never been in bondage to never, no man. Mm, there you were. I saw you. you were over there at the speakeasy. Yeah, there you were. I saw you there. And here you were. And, and, and your father and your, and, and your grandfather, all y'all was doing this. All these things come out. So be careful when, when we judge others. Mm. And now, because of their sin of pride, which unfortunately we deal with here, they are looking at the issue of bondage through worldly defined freedom. Well, we talking about them, right? But no, we're talking about us too, as, as we already alluded to. We are not much different than they were, my brothers and sisters. Let's look out into this world that we live in, this country we live in. We're not even gonna talk about the, the little things that you and I do, but we're gonna look at this country for a moment. Go out into America and tell some of your fellow Americans who are so pumped up with pride that America has a problem and look at their reactions. Speak to them about racial injustice, economic disparities, educational inequality, healthy food deserts, a government comprised of people who are not focused on the needs of the people, and a country that has lost sight of being one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And look at their responses. America ain't got no problem. You just hate America. And is that the one that they really love to say? If you don't love America, why don't you just leave? Are some of the reactions that you'll get. Well, to them and to, for you, in response, I offer this from James Baldwin, one of my favorite quotes. I love America more than any country in the world. And exactly for that reason, this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. Let them know. I still love America, I'm still an American, but America's got a problem, and I'm, I'm here to tell you that America has a problem. And that problem's root, again, is in sin. The reason for this divide, my brothers and sisters, is the problem of sin within worldly defined freedom. Don't believe me? Let's look at verse 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is what? A servant of sin. Those servants of sin, those who don't want to acknowledge the problem with sin are not patriots. They are more perpetuators of transgression. Don't miss that. They're not patriots. They are perpetrators of transgression. After all, look at the events of January 6, 2021. That's all I have to say about that. Not patriots. They are perpetrators of transgression. Mm. But for those who desire the truth of Jesus, Jesus spoke of freedom from sin and all that it involves. Freedom from condemnation. We heard that already. 
in Sunday school, and we heard that in our song already from the, the music ministry. Thank you again, y'all. From darkness and the power of influence of the evil one and an eternity in hell. Thank you, Jesus, for, for, for giving us freedom from those things to those of us that believe in you. In fact, that's leading us to our second point this morning. Jesus liberated us from captivity. Jesus liberated us from sin's captivity. Mm. Jesus came to free us from the bondage of sin, my brothers and sisters. If you miss any of what I said earlier, don't miss this. Jesus came to free us from the bondage of sin. How do we know this? Well, let's look at verse 35. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. Jesus used a household metaphor to drive home his point. Now, we know that a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. Now, this would resonate with the Jewish audience of the time as they understood the importance of inheritance. We, too, can understand that analogy as we here in this world work now have draft, and we draft wills to legally ensure that our worldly possessions are left to our loved ones, right? Well, in this way, these things belong to the inheritors forever. Now, going back to what we're hearing here, normally these things would be left to someone in our family, right? But then what did we say when, we, when we're reading verse 35? Look at that last part. But the son abideth ever. Now, curiously, we see that the S is capitalized. The S is capitalized for a reason, because it's going to tie together verses 35 and 36 for us this morning. How do we know that? Well, let's go right to 36. If the capital S son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Jesus was the son referred to who remains forever in God's household, in which those who are God's family reside. As the son, Jesus is able to make those who were slaves to sin, us, free. And Jesus said, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Those who he released from the slavery of sin will enjoy freedom from judgment Freedom from never-ending suffering at the hands of the power of death and an end to the alienation from God as they were adopted into God's family. That's why we can understand when in John 14, when Jesus told us, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Thank you, Lord. In fact, Let's, let's understand what we were just talking about before a little bit further. Romans 8, verses 1 through 6 tell us, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, it was weak through the flesh, God is sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned flesh, sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That is the righteousness of the law that might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded, as we talked about earlier, is life and peace. And then for those who don't understand how he could free us from death, if we're going to see him in death, listen here. John eleven twenty five 25 through 26 said, Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall live. That's talking about us in life right now, that we shall live. We shall be alive in him. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall not die, shall never die. Believeth thou this? 
And if it doesn't even make sense to you then, and you are someone who is dealing with the issue of death in your life and, and losing a loved one, let me offer you this scripture from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 13 and 14. But I would have you not to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, as others which have no hope. Remember, that's part of what we're talking about today. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them that which also sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. Mm. And for those who are not feeling the connection, if they see, they see that the Jews were God's chosen people, but we are adopted. We are engrafted into his family. John 1.12 tells us, but, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to be sons of God, even to them which believe on his name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your family. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Mm, mm, mm. We learn in the verses following this declaration from Jesus that because of their misplaced pride in being children of Abraham instead of being children of the Most High God, that these quote-unquote believers could not accept Jesus' teaching about freedom. This group would go on to argue back and forth with Jesus through the end of John 8 and miss the truth of his words. And if you've already read ahead, you know that we're at verse 36, right? These people went on until verse 59, arguing with Jesus about, but we Abraham see. Please, 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 Lord have mercy, please, please. Do you, my brothers and sisters, after reading scripture or hearing the words of the preacher, still argue back and forth with God, because you're not arguing with us, with God, while trying to protect what you believe or stand for in sinful pride. When Jesus speaks to you about your church attendance, about Bible study or Sunday school, about forgiving someone who hurt you, about helping someone in need, do you go back and forth with him? Mm. Jesus, you know my heart. Woo! Do you know what they said to me? Now, Jesus, you know I got to work. You know I got to get... You know, I can't handle this, this world without this money. Or I don't have any money, Lord, to give you today. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Well, like we said, we're going to go to verse 59 because I thought that was funny. You know, the fact that we had to go 20-some verses later in. And I found it interesting that those gathered, these believers, were so angry with him that they set out to stone him. They set out to stone him. That's how mad they were. Could you imagine being in the church service and, 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 and the preacher was preaching and you got so mad you was ready to throw Bibles and pews and everything at them for what they said instead of just listening to God's conviction that is being placed on your heart by the words that are coming forth from them? Maybe I should, that's why I should be happy we've got a screen today, you know, because it won't happen to me at least. At least I got some protection. But even more importantly, I have a question. Do we stone Jesus today? Do we stone Jesus when we are unwilling to share about him with others? Do we stone Jesus when we deny what he has done for us after he shares forth his grace and his mercy? Do we stone Jesus when we celebrate, you know, when we celebrate and remember others for their acts of kindness, but not the one that empowered us? or empower them to act. Think about that. We celebrate the first responders. We celebrate someone that does something nice for us. But do we thank God for bringing that first responder? Do we thank God for bringing that person into our life to help us in our time of need? Mm. If we don't, we need, to, we need to think about that because we are stoning Jesus in that manner. And this is the, and this is the interesting part of verse 59 as well. In that same verse, it goes on to say, Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Yeah. Do you know that Jesus will not 
push himself on you if you deny him? He ain't going to push himself on you, but oh, he's, he's, he's not going to be like, oh, man, you don't know what you need right now. Come on, brother. He's not going to be like the person trying to sell you something. He's going to be, he's going to offer himself freely to you. He's going to give his gift of life to you freely. But if you push him away, if you push him away, 2 Timothy 2 verse 12, the B part says, if we deny him, he will also deny us. And then Luke 9, 62, and I know Deacon Chaves, this is one of your favorite. And Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So don't get caught up in the world of freedom and all that what it, the world will tell you freedom is and then slowly back away from your discipleship and think that it's just that easy and you never know the day nor the hour when your time will come and suddenly it may be too late. It may be too late. Remember, Jesus liberated us from sin's captivity. Lastly, what is all this to do with on this day that we will also commemorate something very important, the Lord's Supper, and why it was important to be reminded in the response of reading? My last point being, commemorate, human, <laughs> commemorate humanity's rescue from the impact of sin and transgression. There it is, that acronym I told you all about. Commemorate humanity's rescue from the impact of sin and transgression. Why is it so important on this day that we're commemorating Independence Day, that we would commemorate this moment on this first Sunday of July? Let us not deny the power of the truth of the word of God to truly set us free from the bondage of worldly desires and sinfulness. But instead, remember to continuously commemorate our freedom from sin and transgression. Jesus, in early in his earthly ministry, proclaimed in Luke 4, 17 through 21, that he had fulfilled the scripture from Isaiah 61, verse 1. Here it is. Isaiah 61, 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the, uh, bind up the brokenhearted, and here it is, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. We're not just talking about going up to the correctional facility, my brothers and sisters. We're talking about captivity to sin, as we've been talking throughout today. And although America celebrates an independence from colonial oppression, let us celebrate through communion an independence from the oppression of sin. Communion serves as a reminder to the believer of the sacrifice made by Jesus to atone for the sins of the world. His death on the cross signified that the consequence of sin would no longer have power and ultimately result in the eternal separation between believer and God. You may recall, as we were reading our response to reading earlier, both in 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25, but let's focus on 25. It says, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this is the cup in my New Testament in my blood. Here it is. This do ye as oft as you drink it together in remembrance of me. There it is. There it is. And it says the same thing in the preceding verse in 24. He want, we are to commemorate this experience. We are to commemorate what Christ did, which is our rest. He rescued us from the impact of sin, which we know, you know what is the wages of sin? Death. He rescued us from that eternal, which is essentially a separation from us and God. He rescued us from that. In fact, if it doesn't make since there, maybe Hebrews 9.15 will make it even clearer. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, by, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So I'm wondering, well, before Jesus, how did all those, those individuals have a chance to unite with God for all the transgressions they did? 
Jesus also was able to do that for them too. Remember, he, as he died and he was in the grave, when he went, during that time, he was just not laying in the grave. He went down into hell and brought all those captives to the sins that they committed, all those, all those you know, years and, cent- and all that time before, and he freed them. He freed them. If he was able to do that for them, he's certainly able to do it for you and me, my brothers and sisters. If you really want to celebrate freedom today, let us celebrate the victory of Jesus Christ over sin, death, and the grave. Today, by taking part in communion, we not only commemorate the death and sacrifice of Jesus, but we commit ourselves to continue to fight against sin and transgression. Ah, you're not just remembering and then doing nothing. You're not just remembering taking of the cup, taking of the bread, and then walking out of here and going back to your life. It says that there's more work to be done, my brothers and sisters, once you have taken part of that. If you want to understand a little bit further, read back in 1 Corinthians 11. But let me share this with you. Galatians 5, verse 1 said, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm. Here, here's where we're going to act, right? Stand firm. And then do not let yourselves be burdened again by what? The yoke of slavery. We're not talking about the slavery of man. We're talking about the slavery of spirit through sin. Mm. But how do we stand firm, my brothers and sisters? You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Here's Galatians 5.13. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in what? Love. How can we show that we're, we love somebody more than to be, be there for them in their time of need? To not deny and say, oh, there's no racial injustice. No, you're not being oppressed. That's not showing love, but to say, hey, I identify, I understand, I see what is going on in your life, in your community, and I see what it has done to you, I identify. That is a true person who's showing love. Or even if someone has done you wrong individually, to go to them in love and say that you're sorry. Before you take up that bread and that, and, and, and that drink, that is what you should do. That is what you should do. But not only that. 1 Peter 2.16 said, live as people who are free. Live as people who are free. Now, I just want to just hold on to that one for a moment, because that's, this could be a whole other message, but I just want to be quick about this one. Live as people who are free. Don't live bound to your sin. When God has freed you from your sin, don't live in the, in the grease. Don't live in, 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 the, in the shame. Don't live in the disappointment of your past. Live as people who are free. But not this, though. That doesn't mean go out and do whatever you want to do. Not using your freedom is what the scripture says as a cover-up for evil. But as living as servants of God, don't forget that. You know, that don't go out living your life however you free. Once you done gave the preacher your hand and God your heart or said you did, and then go back to living the way you did before that day. And most importantly, if we act on our commitment to Christ after participating, partaking in communion, we will fulfill Romans 6.14. For sin will have no more dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. 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 Amazing grace. Grace that could save a wretch like me. Grace that gave Dirty, sinful, old me, another chance at life. Grace that made me whole. Grace that gave me hope despite the troubles that I face in my life. It is because of God's grace we were made sons and daughters of God the Father. It is because of God's grace we have been redeemed. It is because of God's grace that we have victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story, how a savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and what? Won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus. 
my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with what? His redeeming blood. I loved him ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. Oh, yes. He plunged me to victory. Where? Beneath his cleansing flood. Never let this idea of freedom escape you today, my brothers and sisters, or evermore. Remember that it is Jesus who gives true freedom. It is not just because of what country you live in, who, who, what government you live in, but as one of God's children, we are free. Free, and in, in when we know that the word tells us, when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Amen. Amen.